Hello, hello, everybody. My name is Dean of the Ink Guild, and I just want to give a quick heads up before the episode. So, this is a recording that we did a while ago, and because of that, things that we talk about might be a little bit dated, so just as a heads up. And one other thing, um, I've noticed that my voice doesn't come through as loudly as it normally does, which is, you know, maybe a benefit for some of you, but... Uh, yeah, so just be wary of that when thing or when my voice especially kind of tends to get higher or lower depending on what you're hearing. So just know that the levels were kind of messed up when, um, like when you listen. I didn't really realize it at the time, but just thought I'd give a heads up. But you know, let that not stop you from what we're talking about today, which is traditional versus self-publishing. So have a good listen, everybody, and enjoy the episode. Season two. <laughs> okay, so I think how... So I've started recording. I think how we're going to do this is for the intro, I'll be like, Hi guys, welcome back. Um, here I am with Alex. Alex will say hi. Gable, er, here, and Gabe. Gabe will say hi. And then we'll just go on from there. Don't tell me what to say. Okay. <laughs> do you think you fucking owed me? All right. Well, there's our actual intro. There's our there's our pre our pre episode intro right there. All right. So, Gabe, if you're willing to cooperate, um, how about I introduce Alex first and then you? Cop. <laughs> Hi friends, welcome back to the Inkill Podcast. I'm joined today by Alex. Hello. And Gabe. Hello. And today we're going to be talking about a subject that I'm pretty sure either a lot of us have been through already or some, or I think most of us haven't been through yet, and that is publishing. Um, specifically, we wanted to talk about traditional versus self-publishing. And to be honest, um, I feel like this might be a bit of a shorter episode because, like, The three of us have spoken before, not really, or like all three of us haven't had a lot of experience when it comes to publishing. So I feel like it's interesting to get our perspectives on it, at least. And like maybe for someone who's listening in, maybe that'd be an interesting thing to go off of. So like, guys, um, like when you're right, like when you've been writing your own respective works, like how, like, have you guys considered uh, publishing like along the way or has it just been something else like so basically like have you guys considered publishing while you've been writing yeah at, at some point it, I, I eventually it comes up yeah it was i mean like the first time i like finished uh like a novel project it was for a class um like a creative writing class where the end goal was to send it off to submit it to publishing um so I had to think about that mm-hmm. in that regard. And then, of course, I mean, if you have goals of becoming a writer, that's something you're going to end up thinking about at some point. Yeah. People can't read your work if it hasn't been published. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, that's ultimately the end goal for a lot of people nowadays. Like, I think before I so I, I know what I want to talk about next. OK, before we or before we move on like what do you have to say on like thinking about publishing um i mean yeah i've I've definitely wanted to publish it it really just comes down to a matter of like finding for me at least it comes down to a matter of like finding a finding like publishers who i think would be appropriate for the work that i'm working on and then actually submitting it which i haven't done because nothing i've worked on is ever finished mood pretty much so I think before um I think before we really move on uh my 
experience with publishing has like i said i haven't really gone into like submitting it like fi or submitting finished copies yet and because the current the only copy or the only thing that i want to publish is um my book xeno everything else that i've considered i've considered publishing to like um i've considered it but i've never really gone through with it and i think like it's always been and like it's always been like which company do i you know do i eventually sign my work off to right like which company would best represent um like what my story is about right and especially like w like which company would help kind of branch out um and expand like what am i trying to say like which company pretty much would be the best one for me and like i've thought about that for so long but I think at some point and like the reason why I wanted to talk about tonight was that at some point I've considered self-publishing, which it's like, it was daunting for me personally. And I'll, and I'll get your guys' opinion on it in a second, but like it felt like, it felt like definitely like I didn't have to worry about like, you know, time to like time to wait. I didn't have to worry about like, you know, possible feedback or like possible like rejection letters or anything like I could just like send off my work publish it then and there and I know it's not that easy but like it's definitely a lot more streamlined getting your book published uh, through self-publishing but like then I consider you know I have to get the like the cover art myself I have to do all of the advertising by myself I have to do all this and that on my own it's like do I really want to put myself through that you know so and especially for like a novel like that that'd be difficult like if you guys were to or i guess uh gabe i'll get your input on it first so like if you were to like have you considered self-publishing um it's crossed my mind from time to time i think one of the hang-ups i have with self-publishing is is aside from like what you mentioned with with marketing and having to basically having to do all the stuff that a publishing house would would handle on your own um I think getting it out there is probably a lot harder. It's, it's a lot of I know a lot of self-published authors basically do it like all through Amazon, through like uh, Kindle and audiobooks mostly, mm -hmm. and that's that's like aside from marketing, yeah. having to potentially make an entire audiobook of my book is a nightmarish prospect because, like, I may say funny shit from time to time, but I know at the end of the day, my voice like if if someone had to listen to my voice for an entire book. They would like. They'd want to hang themselves. Like, <laughs> I have a, <laughs> I have a grating voice. But so that's that's daunting. And then there's also like, I, when you when you're not working with a publishing house, you you run a higher risk. Like, I mean, this is something that I that you just know as a writer. If you if you work with other writers, is that if you don't if you're not working with like multiple people and it's basically just you, then you stand a larger chance of like shipping your book out with with like gaping grammar grammar errors and like yeah. writing issues and like things that would have been cleared up in a longer editing process with more input from from other voices that you might get from a publishing house so that's that's also something that like you just have to worry about cuz like even if you even if you're very confident that you're like a good editor you're not going to be as good an editor as someone else is going to be reading your stuff yeah. so that's that's it's Sorry, go ahead. Uh, I was I was just saying it's like it's a it's definitely something that I've considered as, um for like if I wanted to do a smaller project like I think one of the ways that I if I were to ever do self publishing it'd probably be like in a in the form of like very short stories that I might just publish for for like non profit just to just put, just put them out there you know get a get a name for myself I guess but I wouldn't I wouldn't put them on Amazon or anything they would just be online. That would be one way you could do it, like sort of like a blog, I guess. Not a blog, but because I don't think anyone really reads blogs anymore. But you know, you get what I'm saying, like that sort of thing. Yeah, I get what you mean. Yeah, like I, I um, I think looking into it, like everything that you have brought up, like doing, and you know, we already briefly discussed it, but like an audio, like doing it, like doing your own audiobook, um, finding cover art, all that stuff. Like it'd be there's so much that comes with self publishing that like you said a lot of traditional publishing houses would typically do right like if 
when it comes to self-publishing publishing you're in charge of finding a cover artist which can be really expensive like i've um and 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 this is like i haven't gotten um or actually yeah i have gotten a uh cover art commissioned it was it ended up being like it was from a friend of mine so i ended up getting a decent deal for it but it was still expensive i think it was like a hundred a hundred dollars 125 something somewhere around there and i added on a little bit just because it, he did a really good job of it but like that's so much money out of your pocket or out of your own pocket that um like a publishing house or like a publishing house like would traditionally do for you right like they would find like they would find a good artist that kind of represents your work better um and like because i can draw i like i can draw to an extent like i do sketches of my characters here and there but like doing my own cover art would be so daunting like alex like you like you draw too like imagine trying to do your own cover art for your own book i've thought about it um oh really like for my one project the crown yeah for like well okay i actually in one of my many world building folders um i have many. like this whole yeah one of many i have like a bunch of like i used to actually design covers for my book ideas like mm -hmm. i have um like several versions for uh the diamond dagger because i like drew like the drew like a set and then i drew them years later so i have like several versions of that um, I have one for, uh, like, I have designed covers for, like, a ton of stories, most of which I'll never write. Um, but, like, that was a thing I used to do. Like, instead of writing books, I just, like, design covers. Hmm. And then um, I also, I haven't mentioned this before when talking about my fan fiction history, um, but I had, I have a Wattpad account. Um, oh. Oh, well. I guess we're never going to figure it out. <laughs> it cut out. Yeah. What, when did it cut out? I have a Wattpad. I have a Wattpad account. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, can I keep talking now then? Yes. Yeah. So I have a Wattpad account. I made it when I was in like middle school, I think. You know, like when it was a big thing. Um, and actually, like I, I actually didn't post fan fiction on there i posted like original content mostly shitty poetry um <laughs> but i had like, a couple stories on there as well and i actually like used to go on to like photo editing sites and like make my own covers mm -hmm. for my stories on there so i actually have a little bit of experience with making like covers for stories at least on wattpad yeah. which you know the standards a lot lower but like yeah yeah well <clears throat> excuse me so i like I'm, I'm pretty sure it'd be a lot easier or i'm pretty sure there are ways to design like a like a decent cover for like i guess for like a romance novel or something like i i'd assume it'd be pretty simple to design like cover art that way but if you want like if you're if you're writing a fantasy story and i think that's why I'm a little bit like I was a bit hesitant on self-publishing cover art in the first place was because like I was the one who had to design it like that would mean I would have to reach out to someone pay out of pocket um you know wait how many days until their commission list waits up and then you know make sure that the dimensions of the, like dimensions are all proper because like how like I don't know if you guys have ever had a cover like a book cover like cover to cover commission but like you have to account for what's in front what's in back and the middle section what's the middle section of a book i completely forget the spine the spine i'm i'm a failure as a writer i can't write a good spine for a character and i don't even remember the spine of a book <laughs> i t hey go easy on yourself i only remember that because in hatsune miku's epic saga harry jumps on one in the third book <laughs> Yes, exactly. So, so yeah, you had to account for the front, back, and <laughs> spine, which <laughs> thanks, yeah. Gabe. Which you don't want to. Yeah, because you can easily like estimate it. So, if you were to write out like three hundred, like a three hundred page novel, you could probably estimate how like the dimensions of that, and then 
do your thing on editing websites or you know uh adobe but at the same time like then you have to account for like what can i use like what um how is this going to look how is it like what resources do i have at my disposal that can make this look really nice but at the same time not risk any kind of copyright and that's yeah because that's and like also image copyright which is a thing like there's like websites specifically for going to find images that you can use in like mm -hmm. published works and stuff um but like you know when i was making covers for my wattpad stories i just like went to google and looked something up and then went to like a t picture like editing site and slapped some words on it maybe added a filter and that was it yeah like you can't do that with actual published yeah. works yeah when you have access to or when you have access to like like people who can do that for you and you don't have to pay out of pocket then like i bet it'd be a lot easier and actually um segueing into something that gabe said beforehand on editing i feel like that's probably the most important thing that has kind of kept me away from self-publishing personally because like you guys like you guys know me like I have put in my work on our Discord, like, how many times asking for, like, input on it or something. Like, I want to make sure that everything that I put out, um, even if it's, like, even if it's hindering the actual progression of the story, I want to make sure everything is as clean as possible because, like, I have entertained the idea of, like, self-publishing and completely bypassing, like, the, the need for a professional editor, which I don't think you should do. Like, I feel like you definitely do need, like, a professional editor there for you because they're going to be finding things that, like, certainly I can't find by myself, right? Because it's really hard to edit your own work. And at the same time, like, like I can vet, like I can get my story vetted through you guys, but there's things that you might miss or there's things that, you know, like you guys say that kind of clash or something. Like, I never want to put out something that that hasn't been edited to its best you know what i mean mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so like yeah you can definitely like send it over yeah. to like kindle or amazon or whatever and get it instantly published but at the same time like you'd be, there'd be like how many errors in that in that piece right like in a single chapter alone there could be um there could be like how many spelling errors um style errors like all of that stuff right and that's not to say that traditional like traditional houses are like completely scot-free of this like and i'll get to a specific example when we talk more about traditional publishing but like i think that's just a fear of mine and, and i'd like i, I want to get your guys's opinion on it too like when it comes to like editing and self-publishing like how is it like how is it that like i guess like how do you like how would you kind of go about it like, would you seek, like, a professional editor in general and then self-publish? Or, like, would you just rely everything on sending over to, like, a traditional house and letting them kind of do the editing for you? I mean, like, ideally, I would try to do both. Because, <laughs> like, if I have... If I work with an editor before I, before I try publishing it, then, like, that... I feel like that might... I don't know, like I, like a publishing house. I feel like it's gonna. It's if you if you, pu if you submit something to a publishing house, they're not gonna like look at an unedited like grammar disaster and be like, oh yeah, we'll just fix this for you. We'll just do all this stuff that you didn't bother to do while before you submitted it. And mm -hmm. so I think that I do think you like there is a there there's merit to doing both of those things, and because it's like you kind of need to work with like you kind of you kind of can't submit something half done to a publishing house and just be like finish it for me you're my bitch guess that's one way of looking at it yeah alex how about the you rise, what do you think on that yeah conversely with the rise of um self-publishing and online publishing there's also been a rise of like sites where you can get beta readers where it's just mm. like random on the internet can like go read your work um like point out things to fix and like i think those kinds of things and even on like fan fiction websites like i know that's a really big thing on ao3 
is like having beta readers to help keep your thoughts coherent and stuff. Um, and I think those kinds of things make self-publishing more plausible. And also I feel like that's a wider audience of people that you're going to reach than if you go like to a traditional publisher. Cause mm -hmm. you know, anyone could, could be on that website. You could get feedback on like any um, like diverse characters you have that you might not get from a traditional publishing house, which I think is important and helpful. Um, and then, so I think with that, it, it could go either way. Yeah. Fair enough. Like, I guess like to, I guess, I guess like I, I just kind of like frame the question wrong personally, because like that's, um, like I'm talking, like I was talking about editing and I kind of messed up the question. So I'm like, when it comes to seeking editors or seeking people that could properly help vet your work, like that's something that when you're self-publishing, like I feel like it's more imperative that you do it because at least with traditional houses, you know, they may, they may contact freelancers anyway, but, and, and granted, I don't know how it works, but like they may contact freelancers um, anyway, but oftentimes I'd imagine that they're contacting people that are professional editors or like they've been doing it for said, for said number of years and they really understand a lot of things. But when it comes to self-publishing and, you know, beta reading, editing, all that stuff, like you really have to find all of that yourself pretty much unless you are associated with, um, I guess, unless you're associated with like a group or maybe a writing guild or something like you really like... Mm -hmm. When self-publishing, like, you really do need, a, like, some pretty good connections, right? Mm hmm Like, I, like, in my experience, um, when I was finished the first draft of Xeno, I contacted a freelance um, editor, and, like, he had given me a lot of really good input on it, so in that case... Like, I never had a bad experience contacting a freelancer, but at the same time, like, they do charge, like, he did charge, um, I think it was, like, I don't know if it was per, uh, like, per 100 words or something, but it was, or per, um, like, per page or something, but it was definitely that he charged per, like, per some, like, per quota or something, so it ended up costing me $300 to get a 300 page story edited and to be honest like it was pretty much worth it because i didn't have like regular beta readers at the time right or i didn't have regular creative writing friends that knew a lot about you know grammar syntax and how to apply that all creatively right yeah so it's definitely difficult like i mm -hmm. had to like i had to search around a couple places and you know, I'd imagine that if you are trying to self-publish, like, that's probably your own experience, too. Like, you definitely have to do a lot of um, paying out of pocket and all that stuff. And one other thing that I want to talk about now is marketing. So with self-publishing, and I can, I, I kind of experienced this firsthand because I'm running the Ink Guild Twitter account. Follow us at the Ink Guild. Um, it's pretty much a lot of, like... Um, you know, just hopping onto different, uh, like lift hashtags. So like writers lift, writing community, all that stuff. And just pretty much promoting yourself, which can be really difficult because like you may get followers from it and how I've experienced it. Like we've gotten followers from it, but every time I check back onto, like onto our channel for the podcast episodes, I'd see maybe two, three views on a podcast episode and not really anything else. So like marketing on your own, I'd imagine it'd be really difficult. Like can like um to pose the question to you guys, like how would you feel marketing I guess Gabe in your sense, uh Skybuster and Alex the Diamond Dagger? Like how would you kind of go about doing that? And how would you feel doing it? Like just you know, like how like does that like does the concept of marketing everything on your own kind of like bother you or i'd probably cry and pee my pants uh <laughs> same I, marketing is not my forte i i don't not even just for so before we got cut off um gabe i asked you like how would you kind of or how do you like kind of 
think about the idea of promoting Skybuster? Um, yeah, I, well, I mean, when it comes to book advertising, I don't really like, I don't know. I'm not even sure how I would go about doing that. Like I, my, my immediate impulse. Well, I mean, Skybuster started out as a comic book. So my immediate impulse would be to like, to draw something or, or even to like, to, I don't know, like animate something as like an advertising, but then I, but then I'm immediately curbed by the knowledge that posting like a, like a, a graphic or an animated trailer for a book is a bad idea because you're selling people on like, if I, if I were to make like an animated, like, like 15 second or even 10 second, because I don't know how to animate, uh, and that would probably be my limit. But if I were to make something like that for Skybuster, and then I and then I put that out there, that would be like, even if it were like like best case scenario, let's say it's really really good, then people would watch that and be like, oh, but it's a book. Like I'm not gonna get that experience from this reading. It's like it's like selling on a false experience. So I don't really know. Any time and any time I see book trailers, I sort of have that that gut reaction as well. If I see like a, I remember there was this time a while back, I can't remember what the book was called. That's probably like a good point in and of itself. But I just remember I was at a movie theater mm-hmm. and they were showing trail, like before the movie, like trail, a trailer for a book that was coming out. It was a new young adult novel. I think it was, I can't remember what it was called, but it was like something political. And, and I just remember thinking like, Oh man, this sounds really cool. But then it, it sort of revealed that it was a book and I was like, it's a weird place to advertise a book. It's a weird way to advertise a book. And That's then I, true, yeah, like you can't really promote a book, like how you would promote a movie. Exactly. It's like, yeah, you'd really have to get creative with like how you, you'd really have to get creative with how you market your, like your book, especially like, especially if it's like fantasy too, like there'd be how many things that you would need to factor into, to kind of make it, pop right like if you're like yeah. let's say we do market skybuster at least with like you know fancy graphics or like action scenes and whatever like that would cost a lot it would be very expensive and it wouldn't telegraph like pr- it probably wouldn't telegraph what the reading experience of the book is because you're not going to get the same experience from reading an action scene as you are from watching one mm-hmm. so it's like mm-hmm. It's it's a lot. It would be a lot of resources spent on a trailer that would ultimately like probably leave people with the effect of like, oh wow, that was a cool trailer for a book. I'm not reading that. Fuck that. I don't want to. I don't yeah, want to read. I want to. I want to watch something now. That's put me in the mood to watch something, and that's not the experience I'm going to get from pursuing this. So fuck that. I'm going to go. I don't know. I'm going to watch something else that that thing reminded me of. Yeah. The thing is, I get a lot of, like, ads for books on, like, Facebook and stuff. Um, How are they marketed? They're usually, they have, like, the vague description of the book. Like, at the top, they have a flashy picture, sometimes of the book cover, sometimes of, like, a random guy and girl. Like, I've seen the same picture for, like, multiple different books, so I don't know what they choose. Mm -hmm. Um, Also, I I always get the ads for, like, the weird werewolf romance novels. Because I (laughs) them so funny. Um, like I, and then they have like the dis- the description. Sometimes they have like the whole first chapter in there for some reason. Um, but I don't think that's a very effective way of marketing your books because again, like I tend to click them because I think they're funny. But I've never like seen a book in there that I've actually gone, huh? I actually want to read that. Yeah, I, I definitely think marketing for books is like. It's just a it's a difficult process if you don't have clout because like if yeah. you have clout in the industry that's a whole other issue because you can just say you're cutting out dude you will be like, like you're oh super man laggy. I've oh shit you're good now oh shit uh oh okay yeah basically what I was saying is like it, like if you have clout in the industry then people might see like a little banner on Facebook and it'll say it's written by the author of blah, blah, blah. And they'll be like, Oh man, blah, blah, blah. I've heard of that. Mm-hmm. I, maybe I should check this book out because my friend said, blah, blah, blah is really good, but I've never read blah, blah, blah. But if you don't have clout in the industry, then I think seeing a banner on Facebook, like it's not gonna, it's not gonna sell you on it. Like 
I mean, the thing. I mean, the thing is, most of the books that I've, whenever I go to a bookstore or something, and I and I go to pick out a book, most of the books that I pick out aren't because, like, I saw a trailer on Facebook that really sold me on it, or I saw something that like sold me on it. It's usually I'll I'll see a book, it'll have an interesting cover, or an interesting blurb on the background, or someone's told me that it's good. That's basically like word of mouth and a cool cover are, from my experience, that's like the best yeah. marketing you can hope for. Yeah. I agree. I was going to say most of the books that I tend to read, I tend to like see either one of my friends will tell me about it and say it's really good or I'll see it like getting up like, you know, if you follow like book Tumblr or book YouTube or whatever, then like mm -hmm. if there's a book that's been really a bug on one of like the social medias that follows books or whatever, those tends to be the books that I read the most. Yeah. And then, again, and then again, if you go to the bookstore and you see something that looks interesting, like... Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Like I just ordered... Uh, the first Throne of Glass book just recently hey. uh, tomorrow, <laughs> and nice. I had like for years I had seen ads about that book, those those books on Facebook and stuff, being like, "This is the new Hunger Games or the new Game of Thrones," and I was like, "It's cool that you're telling me that, but whatever, I'm not going to read it because an ad on Facebook told me to." I have one conversation with a group of friends telling me that it tell me that there's a character in book three that i'd like boom i have it i bought it yeah. it's in my collection now and i'm going to read it it's like like seems, seems cool and all but she doesn't seem like she'd punch me in the neck so hard that it would break my windpipe so not as cool I mean, as man probably would to be honest she yeah. is like an assassin but okay yeah like there's enough vulnerability with like aelin that makes her very human and that makes it like she definitely would punch you in the throat but it wouldn't um, be like it, there's like you know, it's probably because she cares about you. Yeah, it's probably because she cares about you, kind of thing. But like with Manon, it's like nah, like complete. Yeah, with Manon, like, completely unprompted, just just break my fucking windpipe. Yeah, exactly. Like there's no, there's absolutely no warning either. At least with like Aelin, she would give you a warning. But with Manon, it's like nah, you're getting punched, yeah. or you're gonna die, and I'm gonna laugh at it. My trachea will be destroyed. <laughs> word, yeah, word of mouth, I'd say. Getting, like, marketing for books is hard because you're basically... I mean, this is an industry where it's like, if your book is really, really good, it's basically going to market itself, like, if you if it does well. That's true, yeah. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, like... And I was going to say, like, I'd imagine trying to market your book like on your own like if you self-publish a book i'd imagine trying to like market that would be like trying to start as a youtube channel or trying to start a youtube channel yeah like, where word of mouth and like flashy like flashy like covers or anything are super imperative mm -hmm. like you need to be grabbing people's attention mm -hmm. like yeah you can obviously market it to friends and that's like what we do constantly you know just talking about our works and whatever but like when you don't have the clout as you said, Gabe, like when you don't have the attention or the backing of good publicity from like these big traditional publishing houses, like you're pretty much on your own. And if you don't mm -hmm. like if you don't have um, like if you don't have, I guess, like if you're if you have if you have a very small support system or like a very small group of friends, like it's definitely going to be hard to do it, especially if like and, and, you know, this is me entertaining different ideas. But like if I was to market, you know, to um like to you guys it'd probably be easy because you guys are have all like been reading stories before like we grew up with like you know harry potter throne of glass all that stuff so we know kind of what um our respective genres are about and we understand where we've all come from in that aspect but when you're marketing to you know some of your high school friends or like some friends from junior high that don't read as much as we do or don't participate in storytelling or do or care or care as much about fictional characters as much as we do it'd be so much harder to really convince them right yeah like you can say you have like, to definitely know mm -hmm. like that's another thing too like when it comes to marketing like knowing your audience like that is super important so like my audience for xeno would definitely be I think, like, I want to say it's young adult, but it's, I think, more along the lines of, like, people who are 16 to 24. So I guess in a way it is still young adult, but, like, like for you guys, like, 
what would like what would oh my god oh my god i'm gonna do it i still haven't even read the last book i need to do that how's it going dean i want to die <laughs> as as i always do when when discord's caught me off more than three times but anyway mm -hmm. that's irrelevant um so i was talking about uh like marketing to i guess knowing your audience so like my age group would be around 16 to 24 and i have a story like about a couple beta readers that i have actually but yeah like um alex like who would like what would the ideal kind of market be for the diamond dagger for the diamond dagger yeah let's just Probably. let's just focus on that because that's the one i think that most people kind of know about in, in regards to this podcast or at least that's the one that you've talked about the most Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know how that happened. It's because that's the one I did in class. That's why. Mm -hmm. um, I think it'd be probably young adult. Because, um, like, my main character is, like, 16, I think. Unless I changed her age again. I keep changing her age and making her older. Um, and then it, I feel like it kind of has that usual YA fantasy feel, minus the forced heteronormative romance. Um. <laughs> so it'd be so it, so it would be some somewhere around like sixteen to twenty four too I think. Yeah, or maybe. maybe like, well, I mean, it depends, skewed, right? It probably skewed just like slightly younger than that. Um, because mm. I find like when I was I started reading books about like sixteen year olds when I was like twelve. Um, and I feel like there's nothing in it that would be mature too mature for that age range. So I feel like it would be young adult. Mm -hmm. okay so i feel like that's yeah uh gabe i um i'm going to make an assumption because i read um i read sky but or at least the first six chapters of skybuster i'd say probably like 14 to 14 to like 22 yeah yeah that's probably where i'd put it yeah because, like, there isn't, like, from what I've read so far, there isn't too much in terms of, like, graphic content. Like, it's kind of, like... No. It, it's... it's very, like, it, it's kind of, um you know, it's, like, there's violence in it, but not the kind of, like, gory, like, out of, like, you know, sensory warning kind of violence. Like, it's definitely yeah. something that, like... A lot, violence, like... It's, like, alien violence. So it's, yeah. like, it's, yeah, it's definitely not graphic or gory. It's, like... Yeah, like, so I guess, like, why I wanted to ask about ages is because, like, trying to find that market would be really, really difficult sometimes. Because, especially with my story, and I'd imagine, Alex, with your story, because we don't have forced heteronormative couples, or, like, you know, forced, forced heteronormativity in general, like, marketing to, like, LGBTQ plus um, youth would, like, I'd imagine it'd be either pretty simple or really difficult. I think, like, again, it depends on if you're going the self-publishing route or the traditional publishing route. I think it depends on whose attention you catch. Because yeah. a lot of the books that I've read that are self-published especially tend to be not straight. Um, whereas most of the books that I read that are traditionally published are pretty straight. But I've still read a few like like queer books that are traditionally published yeah um it's usually not as good in my opinion <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um like i say it could be really easy or really difficult because it could be sometimes hard to find enough people who are willing to like give your book a chance especially when there's been like how many straight couples in storytelling for so long and because you'd be doing it on your own it'd be pretty like it, it, it would be hard to like really grab everyone's attention right like you can market like your fa like you can market a fantasy store and be like oh so there's not a straight couple but what else but, is there to it that's not <laughs> enough know? that's not enough to like convince like to be fair i have read things and watched things simply because someone told me there was a gay couple in it mm -hmm. i have been disappointed more than once by by those things that i've watched and read yeah. um but also i think if you have a good story with like a good concept and it also happens to be like gay on top of it 
that's gonna get a really like good readership yeah so mm. uh so i had mentioned before that i was gonna tell a story so um i actually found my ideal group of beta readers for the story and i've kind of split it so that i have you guys for the technical and more like um stylistic kind of things but recently uh my sister and a group of friends have been very imperative to kind of determining a key factor with my story and this is i, I guess this isn't really too much on like publishing or publishing in general but it's just more like a um like a good plus for me and that I am, i'm headed in the right direction so they are pretty much the market that i want that i want for this book and getting their input on just the first just the first three ta- uh I can't even say it like just the first three chapters has been super super helpful like they are invested and because um like i i initially felt it would be tricky because i am a man writing a lesbian couple or at least the working of workings of a lesbian couple so i wanted to make sure that there wasn't any kind of like forced sexuality or anything like that that like previous like men before me have like butchered and made disgusting so getting their input that i'm doing everything correctly like not only shows investment but it shows that or it it just tells me that i'm doing a good job of it right so Mm -hmm. with that i have found an audience but to find the perfect audience for it like i feel like that take like like years even so I think, yeah, that's pretty much talking about self-publishing, which, as we've kind of attested, is difficult. Um, Would you guys, I guess as an overall kind of close to this section, like, would you guys do it? Uh, It depends. Yeah, I think it depends. I wouldn't be opposed to it for sure. Because like I said, there's a lot, like, probably I have one book series I can think of off the top of my head that I'm pretty sure was self-published. That's mm-hmm. one of my all-time favorites. Yeah. So. So I think personally knowing how much freedom it gives me, but at the same time, how much it like limits or not limits, how much it, how much it'll take out of me. I think I'd personally rather just stick with traditional publishing. So mm-hmm. I'd rather, I just like, you know, I'd rather, I just wait for the long, you know the long queue times maybe get an agent um can we talk about the freedom though actually i feel like that's a really important point yeah okay so not a close on the section on the section yet <laughs> sorry it's sorry okay. to... no it's fine like like i said like i said like i've read a lot a lot of the self published books that i've been pointed towards tend to be more diverse like they'll have like queer characters and they'll have more like people of color and like more like uh, like dis- physically disabled characters and stuff, um, which I feel like I feel like in that regard, self publishing is a lot more free. And I because I feel like a a lot of mainstream books don't really dare to go into those areas as much. Mm-hmm. Um, and I feel like if you're looking for own voices types of stories, it's going to be a lot harder to find traditionally published ones than self-published ones that's fair like if if ao3 and fan fiction sites are anything to go by like there's so much creativity that goes into like that goes into what they say right like they have a lot more like you can definitely find a lot more stories that have you know shipping completely wild characters and all this stuff right yeah and i've read like plenty of fix where like they just like make one of the characters blind or one of them's like in a wheelchair or one of them is trans that you wouldn't find in like the actual story um and i think think like those people if they wrote like if they do write some of them do write their own original work Mm -hmm. and i feel like like you're more likely to find those types of characters in self-publishing books like i can i can think of very few trans characters i'll be right back alex but just keep keep talking i can think of very few trans characters in traditionally public books i can think of even fewer like disabled characters and like the the characters of color is becoming a bigger thing finally about time um but there's still a lot fewer than i've 
in traditionally published works than I've seen in self-published works, just personally in my own experience. Yeah. I mean, that's I, yeah, that's definitely true. I think I think that's something that I've heard from a lot of like publishing houses. That happens a lot in a lot of publishing houses. They'll like they'll either tone down like elements of diversity to to sort of I don't know I don't know make it like I don't um, sell more. I guess it's like just a just as like a we want we want to make this sell more. We don't want to. We don't want people who will see this and like think it's political or something which yeah because people see a gay character in a book and they're like oh you're just trying to push the gay agenda and i'm, I'm like i'm yeah, being forced i'm so being much. forced to, to i'm being forced to read gay propaganda yeah stop shoving your gay characters down people's throats like first of all you're the one who picked up the book <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly yeah exactly that that goes for anything, really. I've I've heard that so much about like movies and video games and stuff, and it's like, bro, just turn your TV off, put the book down. You are not in, in the a. Line... You... Sorry, can you finish. This is not Clockwork Orange. Your eyes are not being forced open while you're bolted to the seat and forced to see the gay. Like you're <laughs> so menacing. <laughs> you're you're actively choosing to engage with media and then getting mad in... when like gay people are in it that's so ridiculous yeah in the wise words of fanfiction.net from like the mid 2000s don't like don't read it's very yeah nice. basically thanks fanfiction.net <laughs> thank you fanfiction.net very cool <laughs> On, like every single fic i'm not kidding like you go on and it's like oh i have this don't like don't read yeah <laughs> i don't doubt it that's pretty simple like if you like if you hear from like a friend or something that like you know you know there's like a gay character there's lgbt characters and you're not gonna read it first of all that's like that's telling of me it's like the hell there's probably more to these characters in the first place and secondly it's like okay whatever <laughs> yeah but anyway um, you guys ready to talk more about traditional publishing? Sure, let's yeah? do it. So, I guess so. So, moving on to traditional public publishing, like I said, um, personally, that's the route that I'm probably going to be going with anyway. Even though I know that me having LGBTQ plus characters, especially like because I'm planning a whole series and a whole lot of them will be featuring that. Like I'm hoping that my ideas kind of stick and that's why it's kind of hard for me to look at different publishing companies, like which one would really help best, um, help best push my work out there because the publishing companies that I've looked at are Bloomsbury, which published the throne of glass books, um, Harper, which published the shatter me books, um, penguin, which has, pretty much a good global outreach on publishing in general and like i don't i'm like i'm not sure like i haven't really looked at any more of them to be honest but it'd be hard for me or at least like i'm i i'm imagining it'd be hard for me to find like a good publishing house that would pretty much let me keep most of my ideas if not like you know, like, obviously I want the proper, like, I want good feedback and, like, you know, what to fix and what and what to keep. But, like, that's, that's I guess, its own obstacle, too. Like, when yeah. it comes to You want it to be your story. Yeah, because I'd imagine, like, with, you know, with making a movie or with making a video game, there's going to be so many people trying to weigh in on your single story, right? Like, there's been how many changes along a video game story. It's like, oh, this doesn't work. This is, like, you could do this instead. So with that aspect, it's like with traditional publishing, I've always viewed it like what is like, what are the formulas that are, that's going to help your book, you know, as, as original as it may be, like how, like how much are you going to be pushing it to really make it um, work with everyone else? Right. Because they're in charge of marketing. They're going to be the ones handling how your book is marketed to people. Right. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, for the longest time, I guess, like, I, I kind of went on a tangent there, but yeah, for the longest time, I feel like me putting in all of the extra work 
and having to rely on myself to market it and you know do cover art and everything like i'd rather i just leave it in the hands of someone else who can do it and even if i might even if it might take a while at least that'll give me time to work on the other books <laughs> so like i got that at least <laughs> yeah so like to open up the discussion like what do you guys think on traditional publishing like I guess, like, in respects to your own work and, like, just kind of, like, the process behind it. What little of it we know, really. <laughs> um, well, as far as my as far as my horror short stories go, because um, that's, like, that's been more of my, like, long-term project, I guess, is just something that I, I'm doing a lot more than writing my, my long-term projects. I just, I just write, like, short stories right now. And then for that, I've, I've looked into a lot of, like, uh, late night horror podcasts and stuff. That's been that's been something that that's been on my mind as like a as a as a as a more traditional publishing. Like maybe not like and a, and a good way to get it out there. Like um the one I'm the one I've I was recommended to specifically to publish was uh, the No Sleep podcast, mm. which is a uh, it's a horror a horror fiction podcast. They just you submit your short horror story and then they'll They'll sort of, they'll read it out on their podcast, and that's like a. That's really well. Cool. I mean, if they if they if it if they accept it, then it's not just like a, they'll just like read anything. But they'll, if they accept it, they they read it on the podcast. You get paid for uh, the submission, and that's been something that I've been looking into because I think, I think that would that would be probably a. I think a podcast like if if you're a short story writer, a po- like submitting to a. Uh, a, sh- a fiction podcast is probably a it's probably a smart way to go about it. Yeah, audiobooks do have a market, and like I've I've read like or I've listened to creative podcasts myself, and it definitely is a really interesting market. That's really cool, dude. Alex, how about you? Any kind? I, I guess like any kind of experience I'm... with like traditional publishing. None at all. Um. Like, I've, like, done, like, the bare minimum of research for it. Uh, Like I said, like, I had to do that for a creative writing class in high school. Um, And, I mean, it just, it always just intimidates me so much because there's so much to do. Because, like, you know, they expect, like, like, in the class I did, we had to, like, write a cover letter. We had to have, like, the first three chapters, I think, like, fully written edited to like look really nicely and then a summary of the rest of the story and then my teacher also recommended having the rest of the story complete so that if they like email you back the next day and are like we want to see the rest of it you can just send it off right away yeah um yeah that's what i've been told too yeah so it's just it's it sounds like a lot of work and um you know if you've got anxiety (laughs) it doesn't make it easier yeah that's a good point, actually. The first, like, the first three chapters, the first five pages, pretty much, like, it's so important, those first few pages, to market, or, like, those are, like, the keys to kind of making sure everything else is going swimmingly. Like, you want, like, obviously, like, in terms of a good story, like, you want to have, like, the first three chapters set up a good fair bit, but in terms of publishing like from what i know about it like they are super important to making sure that your pet like your thing doesn't get rejected and that scares me yeah if you're not interested in like the first couple pages then they're not going to read the rest of it yeah exactly i'm really scared about when it comes to that because i know that i tend to write like really slow openings like Mm -hmm. i don't tend to like make my openings like really action-packed i like to have a lot of build-up yeah um which is like a style that I prefer reading as well a lot of mm-hmm. times. Um, but I feel like that's a lot harder to grab attention with. Yeah, that's that's kind of my style too. Like I have um like I don't I, I doubt it'll change anytime soon, so I'm not really gonna talk about the opening to my book, but I think it gravitates more towards um a build up rather than opening on like a lot of good action and everything. Like it opens up on like the first three a- first three chapters 
open up with a lot of uh, world building and setting up things instead of um, like high action and like you know like you know like tense dialogue and all that stuff yeah but like that's how my style goes so I need to know, so I need to make sure on my end that like it all builds up properly otherwise there's not going to be any investment in it pretty much like if those three chapters to my extent at least if they aren't like luscious and gorgeous with our world building to like especially with how a pick with how picky i am like if i'm not if i'm not content with it then odds are like odds are it probably won't even stand a chance compared to someone else right or compared to an editor who's looking at your work and thinking like yeah this feels kind of half-assed like i i don't want that personally yeah like it's it, it's pretty much like making a good of uh, a first impression right you only get one chance at it Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, but I guess like I, to like to all of this though, like traditional publishing does come with a lot of a lot more benefits than. Well, I say a lot more benefits. Like the benefits being that you know they take care of the marketing, they take care of, um, kind of establishing your your credibility, and like. I guess just like finding your worth pretty much like they really do know how to like pick and choose which ones are the really good ones. Right. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. I guess in that aspect, like it's probably, it'd probably be a lot more comfortable for me at least. And, you know, I'll ask you, I'll pose the same question, like how, like would going the traditional route kind of make you feel a lot safer kind of, worrying about your work getting published like would you feel like there's less of a risk of it um you know like finding an audience pretty much i honestly don't know if we mean finding an audience specifically i feel like uh i don't even know what i want to say like i have thoughts in my head but they're not coherent <laughs> But I mean, like, you know, if you have if you have a book published with like a reputable publishing group, right? Mm-hmm. Like, chances are it's gonna pop up alongside another book that's like vaguely similar to your book. And then if someone liked that other book, then they'll go read your book because it's similar. Yeah, um, I feel like in that way, if you have like a traditionally published book, if it's in bookstores. People are going to see it when they go to bookstores. People are going to see it when they're looking for books online. Um, people are going to be able to like look at the cover and pick it up because you know a lot of tradition or a lot of self-published books don't get like physical copies. And if they do get physical copies, they don't often get into like big bookstores and stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Like a lot of self stuff that I've read is Kindle exclusive or like e well ebook exclusive specifically, not Kindle. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, whereas if it's traditionally published, people are going to be able to go into bookstores. And as we talked about earlier, when going into bookstores is like the best way to find one or one of the best ways to find books. Yeah. That's still like, I, I guess, especially for our, like for our age group, at least, like there's still a lot of people that prefer paper, like paper books over like e-readers, which like which personally makes me really makes me really happy because then it shows that like that's still the benchmark and that's still what the end goal is for a lot of people right is to get their books on shelves right because you can you could easily pick up a cheap book on amazon but the thing is like who like i don't you know i don't read um ebooks for the sole for the sole reason being that it hurts my eyes Right. And I, and I guess like, there's also the thing of like, just having the feeling of a book. Like there's a whole experience when you're reading it on paper. Mm -hmm. And that's a thing that like so many people share, like, um, Jessica, she still reads paper books. Um, my friends who don't read as much as I do, who, um, you know, or they aren't as, um, they don't, they don't do a lot of like creative stuff as much as I do. Like they read paper books like paper i guess like paper publishing and traditional publishing is still like 
the ultimate goal for a lot of people. Which is interesting to me, and that's why, like, I guess that's why I wanted to talk about it. I mean, can you think about it. How cool would it be to have a copy of your book on your bookshelf? <laughs> I mean, like, yeah. when I did, when I finished my NaNoWriMo novel for the first time, I got two copies of it printed out, and I have, like, a physical copy of that terrible, horrible novel sitting on my bookshelf. <laughs> and like I said, it's terrible, horrible, incoherent mess. But it's still really cool to just, like have a physical copy of something I wrote. Yeah. Like that's my that's my goal too. And if you guys can hear stuff that's happening in the background, I'm sorry, but like that's been my goal, I think, ever since I've taken writing a lot more seriously. Like I've wanted to have paper copies of my book on my bookshelf there's like i could probably do it myself at like a staple or something but it's just not, it's just not going to be the same right like i no, want to so cool to like yeah. get mail and you open it and it's like your book Ugh. yeah the satisfaction yeah and i feel like that's probably why like again i can't speak for everyone in our group at least or probably everyone in general but like having that satisfaction of seeing your book professionally published regardless of whichever company like that's still ultimately what we all want right like, yeah we, like we don't expect to like i personally don't expect to be publishing the next um hunger games or you know shatter me books or the throne of glass books i don't expect that kind of um attention but i do I don't even think I want that kind of attention. That would suck. Yeah, like I I just want I just want the I just want to know that my book has started off as an idea and has finally come this far. Right? Cuz my like my book personally has been like 5 years in counting. So like it's like I'm in no rush to finish it, but at the same time like when it's like when it's like when it's on a bookshelf and there's like you know and there are like i guess like 16 to 24 year olds looking at it and picking it up like that'll make me really happy yeah it'd be like hey thanks for giving this book a chance like i definitely like i definitely want to be the kind of like traditionally published author that like doesn't just do like book tours and shit like i want to like go into different like bookstores sign my own book so that like someone who buys it gets a little treat or something yeah like have you well, guys but... like have you guys thought about that like how mm -hmm. like, yeah i guess i, I, I always thought it would be super too. surreal to see like even just, to just like if i was like in a line in chapters and i saw the person ahead of me like was paying for my book i'd be that would be just extremely fucking surreal i'd be i'd yeah, like that... trip the fuck out I yeah. probably wouldn't even say anything. I, I would. I wouldn't draw to draw attention to it. But like, silently, I'd be like, "Dude, holy fuck!" Yeah, I feel this like man... <laughs> like ten to twenty years from now, personally, like I feel like that feeling of someone picking up my book would never change. Yeah, like, like yeah. yeah, exactly. Like how I like how you feel about like oh, someone's got a copy of my book. Like for me personally, Bro. I don't think that would ever change. Like ever. Yeah, if I if I walked into chapters and I saw someone was like I'd be like, Bro, this man's just paying twenty dollars for my elaborate shit post where I nut about shown an anime for seven hundred pages. <laughs> that's a good one. All right, well that's your st that's the standard of holding up to you. That's your first fucking book, dude. <laughs> that better be or else I swear to god. No, genuinely, Gabe, are you referencing like a specific project with that? Skybuster. Really? I, I don't think Skybuster <laughs> is going to be my first. I don't think Skybuster is going to be my first published book, but it. I mean, Dean, you've read it. The whole thing's basically yeah. just me screaming about shonen tropes and how much I love them. Yeah. And it's a great thing. Everyone <laughs> who's listening, it's a very good thing. I hope, like, I hope everyone gets the chance to read it at some point. But like, <laughs> yeah, like as a published author too like I've, I've i've entertained that idea so many times like and i don't think i would even get those ideas if i self-published like i definitely think like traditional pub like i would like i would like in my daydreams i was always like signed to bloomsbury or signed to harper or something 
right? Like I always imagine that, you know, I've, I've imagined doing the book tours and everything, but in my own way, I'd be like, you know, giving everyone hugs and like signing every single autographed copy, even though it's like, whatever, right? Like I, w I would treat it pretty much like a comic con panel or comic expo <laughs> panel. So it's like people who are like, you know, I don't, I don't want to ever just like sign the book. I want to like give hugs, take pictures, all that stuff. Right. Cause personalized messages that would take very long, but I'd, I'd definitely do it. Like I don't want to, in my really dream, just, like, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say in my dreams, I'm usually just like answering people's questions on Twitter. I just yeah. want people to ask questions about my work and be interested in it in that way. Mm -hmm. Like that, that's like my favorite part of fan dialogue is being able to talk with the creators or being able to talk with like other fans and theorize and ask questions and stuff. And yeah. to have people like that for my works would be like the the best feeling. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, honestly, for me, it, my my peak uh, daydream, like like the most ambitious thing uh, that I've thought about is like if I if a fictional food from one of my books ends up on an episode of binging with Babish. I fucking oh made it. Oh my god, yeah, that's I didn't even <laughs> think about that. That's awesome. If that I fucking that's that will be like the I fucking made it point. Oh, do you know what would be a huge honor for me? What? If someone cosplayed my characters. Yeah. Oh, that'd, be, that'd be pretty dope too. That would be or that would be art? like yeah, all oh, fan art. Yeah, that'd be a huge honor. Like I'd be like I'd be retweeting everyone's fan art. Like maybe not the dirty ones, but like I'll oh, have a separate oh, account for that. Especially the dirty ones. I'd be like, hey, yo, check this out. This dude made porn of my characters, bro. <laughs> Just I guess Just, look <laughs> not not the underage characters. Because you know there's gonna be porn of your underage characters too. Don't reblog that. Yeah, that's don't true. Yeah, that. no, I have no. I have circumvented that mistake. I have circumvented that problem. None of my characters are underage. I have circumvented that problem. I have I, I have I'm I'm i I'm ten steps ahead of you and everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> this man is prepared, everybody. <laughs> yeah, like uh yeah, no, I feel like that'd be a huge honor. Like, fan art. Like, I've thought about, like, f like fan art, fan fiction, too. Oh, my God. Like, I... So, I don't know if I told you guys this, but uh, Jessica, actually, she wrote a very quick fan fiction of Porter and Magna. And that's technically... <laughs> oh, that's technically, like, my first ever piece of fan fiction ever. And it it, it, it made me so freaking happy. I was I was over the moon, guys. Like, oh my god, and I, and I can't imagine like, like that was the first piece, and that will forever be the first piece of fan fiction, no matter what. Like when the book gets published, like and people actually start doing fan fiction of it, like Jessica's will always be the first piece, right? And the feeling that I got, like reading my own characters in that situ, or, like in a situation that she completely wrote yeah. on her own, like I don't think I'd ever, I I don't think I'd really ever get over that. Yeah, like, you have to do. You, you have to be more careful with fan fiction when you're published, though. Mm -hmm. There's like more rules about that, I think. There's more what? Sorry. Like rules about like if you read fan fiction of your own work, then you can't like publish anything else from mm -hmm. that because you know they're like con cons similar. Damn it! I was about to say like, I think fan fiction and. <laughs> Uh, risque fan art like that's that that is the truly effective form of guerrilla marketing tactics that that you'll need okay wait complete complete off not complete off note but like to pose the question how would you feel about not safe for work fan art of your characters because i would probably be uh, I'd I'd be like I'm I'm putting it out there. I'd probably be a little bit iffy on it. I'd be it, extremely um, supportive of it. For me, it would depend on the characters because again, I have a lot of like underage characters, which I would not support mm -hmm. uh, that kind of fan art being drawn of. But if like it's like my adult characters, then yeah, I'm fine with it. Yeah, like I personally like I like I say I'm iffy on it because I don't have many 
like as of like as of right now no one is underage it's just that i'm worried about like the flashback scenes when they are underage like if they're draw like if someone's sick enough to even think about doing that like that kind of worries me because there are people that do that but people are, people are definitely sick enough to do that yeah, yeah. My, i mean my other, my other one is that, oh my god if you look up shrek sonic on google images and turn safe search off you will know that there is there are as always people sick enough to do anything all right well i'm not doing that for this podcast but i'm pretty sure if anyone's listening they can do that on their own time <laughs> But. Yeah, and then my other one is I have a lot of characters who are siblings, and I've seen oh, enough. Oh no! Incest. Yeah, that's oh, the god. Yeah, <laughs> that's the thing you yeah. have to be careful of. It's not even. Listen, you have a you have an underage character in your story. It's probably safe. If you have siblings in your story, you're that then. <laughs> that's they're good. They're gonna be some shit. There is. There yeah. is. Yeah, the opposite of safe. Not safe for work content. Mm. Yeah. Ooh. And I have so many. I do it way too often. Yeah. So wait. So on fan art, how about fan fiction? Same thing. Yeah. Same thing. Be very supportive. Yeah, I'd pro- like. I guess it depends for me because, like, I, like, my intention with writing Porter and Magna, uh, from the beginning has not been to over sexualize them in any degree or to any degree, pretty much. Like, I don't want them to be like constantly flirting with each other every single dialogue like they do flirt with each other but not all the time right and it would kind of worry me and to be honest maybe anger me anger me a bit if someone does end up really sexualizing their relationship because that's what i wanted to avoid from the beginning yeah but again that's that's why you have to part of why you have to be careful with that kind of stuff is because you know People are going to sexualize it because, you know, that's a big part of the appeal of fan fiction is, yeah. you know, finding a stuff of characters you ship. Um, yeah. But if you don't want to read that stuff, then don't read it. That's fair. Yeah. Don't like, don't read. Yeah. Just What? Don't like, don't read, isn't that? Yeah, isn't don't that like, don't read. Exactly. Yeah. You're responsible for your own fandom experience. If you don't like something, don't read it and don't complain about it. <laughs> yeah. I like so I guess speaking on like being a traditional or traditionally published author too, like I would I imagine I wouldn't have as much free time as I would want because like let's entertain the idea that I got um my ideal scenario and that is being a full-time published author but at the same time having a side thing with youtube um and and doing this pretty much like continuing to do podcasts or like fun skits or something that engages my audience a lot more that not only finds out how i am but like you know kind of like digs into my writing process like i don't know how much time you would need to do like, I know, obviously, like, writing books takes a long time, but, like, I also want to have some kind of freedom when I do these creative things, if that makes any sense. Like, I, I like I want to be able to engage my audience, not just by Twitter or by Instagram or whatever. Like, I really want to involve myself into the community because, like, if they found something special in my in my writing, then I want, then I want to give some stuff back, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Again, and we've talked about this briefly, um, but like I have massive world building in my stories in like some of my specific stories that like honestly probably won't even be touched on in any of the actual stories that I ever published. Mm -hmm. But I'd still love to share that kind of stuff. And so like the idea of having like a YouTube series where I like go into details about like some random part of my lore that you won't find anywhere else or also publishing like you know there's a lot of like the world of whatever types of books that i also think would be really fun Mm -hmm. to just have and i feel like if someone's really invested in your world and in your stories that's that's a great way to reward the readers and also contribute your ideas to the world yeah that's a whole other thing too like on like fan fiction fan art all that stuff like if someone takes like little details that you've incorporated into into your book or even like off details that you've omitted but they still exist as part of the world like if that ever has been brought to life i'd be like over the moon guys like i'd be going insane like 
you know, you talk about like drawing out your characters, this and that, but like if someone, especially like some of my favorite artists, like if they were to draw like my character in this one scenario that I only mentioned once throughout the entire series, I'd be, I'd be, I'd be crazy. Like I'd be so grateful for Mm -hmm. that. Like it's like, it really shows just how much of an impact your work has done. Like, and, and that's, I guess to, you know, tie it back to what we were talking about, like, like publishing or traditional or self-publishing, like if your work touches people and like really has an impact in their own, like, um, like really evoke something in them pretty much like it's amazing to see just how much they were like they show off their appreciation right like it's really like i guess it's just really cool i mean have you seen some of the like fan work that exists in like the lord of the rings fandom oh yeah like if we want to talk about stories with that they take random obscure things from like the back corner of the Silmarillion and it's write like massive stories about it. Mm-hmm. Like Tolkien fans or something else. <laughs> yeah. To that extent too, um, look at the Mandalorian, which is set in the star Wars world, but it's complete, like it's completely different. Like it's its own story. And that is super interesting. Like, mm like someone kind of creating their own narrative within your own world that'd be something really cool too but i guess that's a yeah. conversation for another day um that's isn't that all kind of what happens in like the comic book world is that like people will take like a character like a random side character from one of the old comics and then make a whole story about them like isn't that how the winter soldier came into existence yeah, basically. I, so. I, I don't know. I don't know comic book history, but I, I I feel like that was probably yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, like yeah. that's like that's the whole like I I love seeing like a fandom take a character that like either has like they kind of take them away from their own narrative and do their own thing with it. So like you know kind of a weird example but like if they're going to like this dingy cabin just to fuck that's interesting i don't know why you would do that but you can do it um but then you know you have other like you have like side characters like you said alex that like didn't really have a lot of significance and bring them on their own venture which makes them cool that's so that's like incredible to me and like that's why I guess again to tie yeah. back to what we were saying, like it's not to say that all of that is guaranteed when you traditionally publish. Like certainly, if you self-publish, you'll have all of these things too. It's just that I feel like it would probably be a lot more difficult, and it, and it would take a lot more time to get there because self-publishing is still like I don't want to say it's relatively new, but it is something that um not too many people have done. Like I know a lot of people on our Twitter account, at least like they plug, um, they plug their own works and I, and I'm hoping that they're like doing good with it, but like, is their work really going to get catapulted as well as, you know, as well as getting the exposure from like traditional publishing houses, if if that makes any sense, like, I guess, yeah, I think I'm, I think I'm kind of out with, topics i think that's like it, we've been talking for like an hour and 20 minutes so yeah far, and that's been really well done so i think like if there's anything else you gonna you, uh, you guys want to bring up then we can start wrapping it up weren't we gonna talk about um uh errors in like traditionally published works i felt like you said something about oh yeah, that. yeah yeah so thanks for bringing that up actually so um i guess with traditional publishing there isn't it's not always completely guaranteed that um, you're not going to have a few errors in it. Like I've seen yeah. plenty of traditionally published works that I would expect have gone through numerous like editors, um, you know, different drafts and whatever. And there's still like errors in it. One of those being, um, and I don't want to think, I don't want to like point out this one, example specifically is like the worst of the worst but like god damn it why is it that every time like one of us is setting up a topic discord just immediately cuts off okay are we back 
Yes, Are we we're back? back? Yeah, we're back. So, in the so like I was saying, um, in the Shatter Me books, I think around the first one, there was. Uh, so there was a dialogue exchange between I think the main character and a side character, um, or a side ally pretty much, and like it had it hadn't been properly formatted to convey that the other person was speaking, so it was all in one section, and that really irritated me. Like I don't know if you guys well, ever I was noticed gonna... that, but like, uh, you were gonna what? Sorry. So no, finish what you're gonna say. I'll, I can say it afterwards. Yeah, well, I mean, like, that just irritates me that, like, I understand that, you know, it's a, like, it's a demanding process. Probably, like, someone might have, someone must have missed it, but at the same time, like, with such an expectation that you've kind of set up that, like, traditional publishing has numerous editors, sometimes at one work, or, like, how many, like, I understand that, like, editors get swamped, but at the same time, but at the same time, it's like, oh my god, yeah. Why is it there? <laughs> yeah. See, the thing, one thing that I tend to notice is that once authors kind of blow up and have a lot of books coming out, the editing in some of the later books can get really sketchy. Like, I've noticed this in, like, Sarah J. Moss's books. Some of her later books have some weird errors in them. Um, mm -hmm. Rick Riordan is bad for this with, like, at least pacing-wise with his stories a lot of his later books have weird pacing that does not make sense um like i think i've seen that in cassandra clare books too like i feel like certain authors once they get to a certain point their editors like don't try as hard because their books are going to sell no matter what yeah that's the, the, thing gone, too. the club's gone to their heads yeah, yeah. it's either, like it's either gone to like the author's heads or it's probably gone to like the publisher's I mean, that's why, I mean, that's like, you were saying, like, uh, you wouldn't want to be, like, on a Hunger Games level, and that's why I said, like, that would just suck anyway, and this is, like, kind of why it's, like, like, as an author, I think you do want to have, have, like, a modicum of success, because, you know, not starving to death sounds pretty sexy, but, like... Yeah. Sounds very sexy. Uh, <laughs> at the same time, you don't want to be in a situation where it's, like, you have to, like... And where like the the clout of being of being like an it author has sort of gone to your head, and you just start. I mean, prime example: not Hatsune Miko has definitely let her clout go, go to her head. Yeah, I was just gonna say. <laughs> yeah, not Hatsune Miko. <laughs> wink, wink. Wink, wink. Ha ha. Turf. Uh. <laughs> we at the Ink Guild podcast are uh, pro trans rights. <laughs> yes, we are. Anyway, yeah. so, um, oh. yeah, I, like, um, I'll let you finish off, actually. I'll save my thing for later. I was just going to say, a man is lost without the sauce, but a man can get lost in the sauce. Yeah. Like, that goes, like, pr like I said, it kind of goes both ways, too, with the author kind of, like, it, it, I guess in some aspect it would kind of make sense that the author is very relaxed in their style. They don't really try to differentiate from it too much. Like, you, you can kind of tell that once an author has their signature style or, like, their crutch words or anything, like, they really stick to it and they don't really try to differentiate. Which I guess makes sense because then it's like, oh, you read like you know you're reading a Sarah J. Mass book or you know you're reading a Le Bardugo book or something, but at the same time, like yeah. you know, that doesn't that shouldn't exclude the errors that are come that are gonna come with it, right? Like as an author, yeah. you're obligated to make sure that you're putting out like good grammar in your books. Right? Mm -hmm. Like style yeah. is subjective, but like like grammar and like grammar and punctuation is not or punctuation you can make a creator but like have good grammar <laughs> pretty much yeah like, and then on, on a similar note can i just say i also think once authors are kind of big uh like editors have a harder time calling them out on certain things mm -hmm. time to drag my other favorite author to drag if we're talking about like game <laughs> of thrones <laughs> oh uh. a lot of his like the first book i because i haven't finished reading all the books but i remember reading the first book pretty quickly and then after that they just get really long because he just puts 
so much detail in it into it that's like not necessary and it just mm-hmm. drags out the books and i feel like because you know george R. R. martin he's the author of game of thrones you can't really like call yeah. him out on it yeah well that's why winds of winter is never coming out because it's like no one's gonna tell him no and he's just gonna keep doing stuff and yeah people are just gonna keep not telling him no because you can't tell him no i mean he's working yeah. on elden ring right now so like we got that at least <laughs> I have that at least. I've at the very least heard that his work on Elden Ring is finished. I don't know how, but well, if it is what finished, is it's a thing. It's a video game developed by or that George R. R. Martin is um, giving his input in pretty much, and it's being developed by uh, the people who make some of the hardest video games ever. But again, whole other conversation. Let's not get, let's not That's, get too sidetracked right yeah. now. Um, we can talk about that after exactly so like I was saying like the author is def- like definitely has faults for their errors but I feel like yeah. when it comes to name value alone because a name can sell so much sometimes it's the editors or the publishers that can kind of be guilty of that too just kind of like bypassing some errors here and there because like if you're going to be selling a book by not Hatsune, not Hatsune Miku um <laughs> Like, their name value alone is going to be enough to, like... Like, you're going to get, like, a few, like, thousand people on it easy. Yeah. So I then, mean, people bought Cursed World. Yeah, so, like, with that in mind, like, you can kind of... Ex- like, it'd be kind of easy for them to gloss over, um, you know, small little things that probably other people like us, at least, wouldn't be able to find out. But, like, you know, all three of us read a lot. Or at least, at one point in our lives, we did, so... You know, we'll, we will yeah, we will find these things. About, yeah, and if we want to talk about like name connections too, like I just grabbed the book that's on my bedside table. Um, it's called *The Providence of Fire* by Brian Staveley, which like you've probably never heard of Brian Staveley, I have, but no. there's a but there's a quote on it from V. E. Schwab, um, about the first book in the series. And I think having, like, you know, a well-known author, like, praising a book on the cover also is going to help sell it. Mm-hmm. You know, if you find, like, a book um, and, you know, like, one of your favorite authors has said they like it, you're probably going to be more drawn to it. Yeah. Like, Vish is one of my favorite authors. So, obviously, if I see that she likes these books, I'm going to be drawn to them. Mm-hmm. I guess, like, on a very small thing, too, um, one of my favorite artists um, out there is, her name's Charlie Bowater. She has done different commissions on the, uh, uh, for Sarah J. Mass's books, like uh, Court of Thorns and Roses and Throne of Glass. When I found out that she had commissioned, or that she had done a book cover for a book that I'd never heard about, I really contemplated buying it just for the sake of Charlie's name being associated with it, but at the same time, like, Like, that's just how much influence that, like, a book has in terms of, like, selling power. Like, you could really, like, sell a book on name value alone, pretty much, and not have to worry about, like, you know, not have to worry about, you know, a lot of grammar, like, presentation, all that stuff. Like, I think, and I guess, I guess, like, personally, I don't ever want to be, like, I don't ever want to sign a company like i don't ever want to sign to a company that has me filling out quotas mm-hmm. i guess like i like I, like it's not to say that i'm gonna be taking like five to like five to seven years writing a single book like absolutely not but like i want my like i want like the books that i put out to be the best possible version that they can be obviously with editing in mind but like the book that I want published on shelves is the one that I'm most proud in. Like, I don't want to see, you know, formatting grammar errors. I don't want to see like this and that, that kind of like that, like people who would nitpick would kind of detect like, and I'm a nitpicky person. That's probably why I'm very like, you know, stingy about that, I guess. Like, I want to make sure that when I like I guess like when I'm reading the book and when I have a copy in my hands I don't want to find a grammar error I don't want to find like you know two sections combined when they shouldn't be and like start hating myself for it because then it's going to be like 
oh god i hate myself like why would the editor like leave me like leave it alone like that like why would like why is it there pretty much i mean for the record dean you should not hate yourself for that but i do get where you're coming from like yeah so thank you for thank you for that i know like i know i shit on myself a lot but like I don't really. I just meet it in good fun a lot of the time. We're at the Intel podcast. We also all have anxiety. Yeah. So that doesn't help. <laughs> it does it doesn't it does not help when your coping me- mechanism is just shitting on yourself. Yeah. But anyway. Yeah, like I like I hope to find like a good enough company that re- kind of represents or that I guess that like gives me time. Right, like mm-hmm. I, I never want to. Like I said, I never want to sign with a company that's like, oh, you have to write a book within a year and then we'll publish it. And I, and I never want my works to be sold just on name value alone. Right, yeah. like I want everyone to really pay attention to the story that I'm telling and really understand like the stylistic things that I've done. Whatever, like I don't want just my name to sell a book because then, I guess to. I guess to kind of quote what Gabe's been saying, like the clout would have gotten to me and I would have gotten a stick up my ass and that'd be all my fault. So I do think it's hard to avoid that though. Like if your book is successful enough, if enough people read it, if you publish something else, people are going to buy it just because it's written by the same person who wrote this other big book. Mm-hmm. Like that's going to happen. That's fair. Like um, I, I understand that, but at this, but like from where, I, where I'm coming from is I don't want I don't want a subpar book. Yeah, you still want your book to be quality. Yeah. And up to your standards. Yeah, like, I don't want a subpar book under a good name, I think. I think that's what I'm getting at. Mm -hmm. I don't want a subpar book under a good name. Like, I want a good book under a good name. And even, I I guess to some degree, too, like, even a good book under a subpar name. Like or no name even or no name yeah like if like if there's a book out there that you know you know a friend recommends to me that i've never heard of their book and it turns out to be the best freaking thing i've ever read that's awesome right yeah. like it's it's definitely a lot i guess like at the very lowest it's a lot easier to take in than a book that's been sold by a great name but it turns out that you know there's grammar errors in it there's like very terrible decisions that have been put into it or they're not Hatsune Miku. Yeah. Or Sorry. they're yeah, or they're not Hatsune Miku. But anyway. Um Yeah, I think that's it. That's pretty much the discussion. It's been that went a lot longer than I thought it was, to be honest. Like I was expecting the conversation to go like twenty, thirty minutes, but it's almost been or it's just past an hour and a half pretty much. We are a group of strongly opinionated individuals. Yes, we are. And we drag people along the way. <laughs> so... I'm still thinking about the last Magnus Chase book, okay? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I guess with, um, I guess uh, to kind of wrap up, um, thanks for listening, everyone. You know, you guys know where to find us. Our social media will be down in the description. Um and I guess because I like doing little close-ups on everything, um, I guess like what would be what would be the point that you know you've made it as a writer? And it can be like it could be a joking thing or a serious thing, but like the book on the shelf, fan fiction, whatever. Like what like what do you think is the point that you know you've made it? Well, okay, well I was I was kind of joking before when I said like I would be extremely supportive of people who make porn of my characters but like that would be <laughs> no if i if i would go online and i find out that my story has not only inspired creativity in others but horniness in others then i'd be like i made it i did it boys yeah like it like your characters are really making your are really making people <laughs> feel all kinds of ways you know what i'm saying uh- <laughs> If I if if that's if that's the effect that I'm having that if I'm having any kind of effect I mean like even on a serious note if I'm having any kind of like effect on someone that makes them just have to open up Microsoft Word uh, turn off their browsing history for a bit and just 
wild the fuck out on their keyboard, <laughs> then, like, I've had an effect on someone, so that's, you know, that's pretty decent, even if it is smut. Fair enough. Alex, how about you? Uh, with what I said earlier, uh, if someone asks me questions, a question about my world, that that would be my point of having made it. Having If someone cares enough to want to know more. Mm-hmm. And for me, um, I guess I have two answers. So my serious answer is fan art. And jokingly, and I guess kind of half joking, but like, I, I, I would know I've made it if one of, or if my favorite, if my favorite artists out there start doing fan art of my characters and I didn't commission them beforehand. Oh my god, could you imagine? That would be amazing. <laughs> like I'm gonna like I'm gonna Yeah, so like I'm gonna be like you know, I'll open up Instagram or Twitter one day and I'll find like Morgana and Ogram or you know, um Mer Wild or whoever. Like those are my favorite art or Ryko art or like if I will like if I see my characters drawn by these people, I will quite literally lose my shit. <laughs> Yeah. Like, it won't even be the like it won't even be the sense that I made it. I will just completely like I'll probably like drop unconscious. <laughs> Cause then it's like it accomplishes a couple things. One, it knows that like they like it they recognize the investment that this character has. And two, I didn't have to pay for them to do it. <laughs> I saved some money. They they did it for their <laughs> own sake. Some money. Yeah, they did it for their own sake. and uh, They did it yeah. for the sake of their own fans or, like, for, for the fandom that, like, my book inspired, right? Yeah. And, like, that'd be awesome for me. <laughs> I'd love that so much. But... Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna collect fans of all my characters one day. I'm gonna have, like, a big poster board on one of my walls and just, like, print out fan Dude. art and, like... Like go to like conventions and buy it or whatever oh my god yeah Dude, like yeah if, if i had fan fiction and shit written of my stories i would i would gloat about that shit so much i would not be cool about it at all i would be such a dickhead yeah i'd be <laughs> like i like to the to the comic-con thing too like if i see someone who's like selling prints of like my artwork to them i wouldn't even be I wouldn't be like, hey, you got licensing for that right like that's a dick thing i'd be like yo can i get a picture with you and they're gonna be like what the hell? You're the author of this character, and I'm like, but you drew this character, but you drew my character like this. Let me get a picture yeah. with you. Like, yeah, yeah I, 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 I just, I just be like, I'm buying this man a drink. Yeah, honest, like, honest to God, like if I, if I like, I guess to that example too that I was talking about, like if one of my favorite artists um did end up drawing one of my favorite characters without like. I guess without even notifying me, like they did it for like for the audience, pretty much. I'd be like, "I love you so much. Here's some money that like I would have asked you to do anyway. I just pay them. I just pay them for a work that they did out of like, out of like filling their own thing or something. Like just thank you. Yeah, yeah. That's literally life goal is to have a pin board somewhere in my house of just like fan art that people have drawn of my characters. Yeah, I've imagined that too, actually. Like, I would have, like, I'd have in my house, no matter where it is, like, I'd have, like, a pin board of fan arts and, like, a little, a little, um, I guess, like, a little shelf of, like, custom made gifts and stuff. Like, people have done Throne of Glass Pops or Funko Pops, even though I guess the three of us and pretty much everyone in the group chat is like, ew, Funko Pops, the hell? Or, like, you know, like, can you, like, can you imagine, like, a little Alley plushie? It'd be so like, cute. She would be so cute as a plushie. Yeah. Or like, but like no, like imagining like going to Hot Topic and they have like a whole section and just like buying all the like Hot Topic merch of your story. Yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> oh like, my god. Gabe with Skybuster. Like, can you imagine like one of if like, I a, fucking a custom like, went... in, like a custom is a uh, custom instrument based oh, off of is... Skybuster? If I fucking like went onto Amazon and like to look up like Gundam kits. And I saw fucking if I saw like a Starlight Overdrive kit, I would actually fucking pass out. Yeah, like it's amazing what fan culture can do, and depending on like our output, like we could become part of it. And not gonna lie to you, it would probably get to my head a little bit, but then it'd have to be like, okay, oh, come, totally calm, down, calm down, come down just a second. 
<laughs> I'd be yeah. unabashed with this shit. I can talk shit about uh, not Hatsune Miku all I want, but I know that if I okay, I don't, I don't think I'd go as crazy as her because, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but like, I, I, ho- I hope you wouldn't. No, uh, but I. I this I, is your I, tab I, in life, I, Gabe. If you fuck I, up, I'm referring to this moment. <laughs> I might go a little. I might go. I, I might just go a little nuts as a treat. Yeah. Yeah. No offense, but if you went as crazy as not Hatsune Miku, I would have to disassociate dissociate myself from you. <laughs> yeah, it'd be like no. Oh, he's no, no, pulling a not no, Hatsune no, Miku that's, friends that's, off. Listen, if if I am ever listen, if in the future I am ever like the subject of a controversy, I want y'all to go full blast on me and like say the worst shit you can about me. Okay, I don't even. I don't. Even, if I ever betray my fucking ethics and like let fame get to my head and become a shithead i want like no mercy same right. let's yeah. let's swear on it, guys yeah mm-hmm. i swear on that too we like the three of us or like anyone really should not be above accountability yeah all right i guess with that in mind let's call it let's call it for tonight so thanks everyone for listening hope you had a good or hope you had a good one um i guess thanks for tuning in and We'll see you next time we see you because I really need to get a grip on editing these on a, on according on according properly. Anyway, thanks for listening and everyone have a good night. Bye. Peace.